Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we are going to be doing Cambridge International AS and A level chemistry. This is the paper one, multiple choice. We are going to be doing May June 2023 series. This is the code 9701 version variant one. We have one hour fifteen minutes to do this, so let's get started. Okay. Question one, element X has six more protons than element Y. Which statement must be correct? So we know from the given information, we know that X has six more protons than element Y. X has six more protons, six more protons than element Y. Okay, so we know this. Which statement must be correct? So let's look at the options. Atoms of element Y are smaller than atoms of element X. Now, this cannot be true, right? Because atoms of Y cannot be smaller than element X because we already know from the information that we are given element X has six more protons. So, assuming that they are in the same period, right? Assuming that these two elements are in the same period of the periodic table, we can say that x which has more protons than y should actually be on the left side of the periodic table all right and y should be uh, sorry on the right side x should be farther in the right side of the periodic table and y should be um in the left side of the period because as you know as you go across the period the proton number increases and because x has larger proton number than y what happens is that this the atomic radius is going to be smaller. The atomic radius, radius of X is going to be smaller than atomic radius of Y. So in here, it's saying the opposite. Therefore, this is going to be wrong. Question B. Element X has a full shell of electrons. Now, we cannot know whether this is correct or not. So we can skip B for a while. We come back to B. Let's look at option number C. Element X and element Y are in the same group. Are they in the same group? We cannot say that they are in the same group because it, it depends on where you're looking at in the periodic table. So, for example, you, ha you are given the periodic table at the end of this question paper. At the end of this question paper, you are given the periodic table. Right. In this periodic table, right, you can look at it. Um, so, suppose, right, suppose uh, we can say sodium, right? Sodium is in period number three. Right, and then phosphorus is in period number, uh, uh, group number fifteen. Right, period number one and, uh, I mean, they both are in period number three, but they are in different groups as you can see. Right, phosphorus is in group five or group fifteen, sodium is in group one. Right, you can see they are not in the same group. You cannot say that they are in the same group. Right, now element and element X are in the same period. Now we also cannot say they are in the same period because it can be a matter matter of whether you're taking sodium, right? Sodium is in period number three, and then taking potassium for example, period number four. All right. So it cannot be like that as well. So the only correct option option is going to be B. So we have to choose P as the correct answer. Okay. Question number two. Which statement explains why calcium has a higher melting point than barium? Why does calcium has a higher melting point than barium? Well, this is because calcium cations are smaller than barium cations and have a stronger attraction to the deoluminous area. This is correct. Now, I'll tell you why this is the case. Because calcium ion, cations, remember calcium cations, you, calcium and barium are both from the group 2 metals. They are both group 2 metals, which means they form both calcium 2 plus and barium 2 plus. Now, barium is so much um, further down the group in group 2. So what, what happens in the down, going down the group? So the atomic radius increases, right? The number of shoal increases. However, the charge is still the same. The overall net charge is still the same. So what is this trying to tell us? So therefore, calcium cation, the outer electrons are closer, right? Because there are less number of shells in calcium the outer electrons are more strongly attracted by this positively charged nucleus. Whereas barium has so many, um, 
has several layers of um, these electron shells. So they are, they are basically more shielded, right? The shielding effect. So therefore, calcium cations are smaller than barium cations, stronger nuclear attraction to the ultra electrons, ultra valence electron. Therefore, calcium has a higher multi point than barium. Okay. Okay. Question number three. Three statements are about potassium chlorine and their ions are listed. Now, question number, uh, the statement number one states that the atomic radius of potassium atom is greater than the atomic radius of chlorine atom. Now, if you check the periodic table that's, uh, that is given to you at the back of this paper, you can see, you'll see that chlorine is in group uh, in period number three, right? At the end of period number three, there's argon beside um, chlorine. And potassium is at the first of the next period, which is the fourth period. Potassium is in the fourth period. So you can see they are on different periods and different groups. And the atomic radius of potassium atom is obviously going to be greater than the atomic radius of chlorine. Now, why is this? Well, because chlorine, potassium is in different group, right? There is an extra shell, an extra shell, right? Period number four. A period number four means the N, N number, the principal quantum shell increases. And when that increases, the shielding effect increases. Right, so the effect increases. Therefore, uh, the nucleus nucleus cannot strongly attract the outer valence electron. You know? so therefore, potassium atomic radius is going to be smaller, I mean greater than chlorine, because it cannot be strongly attracted. However, chlorine has also um very strong attractive force to its outer electron. Therefore, statement one is correct. Now, statement one is correct, so we the option can only be A or C. It cannot be B or D. So I'm going to skip two and go on to three. The ionic radius of potassium ion is greater than the ionic radius of chloride ion. Now, this is obviously wrong because when you compare any two N ion or cation, right, a cation will always be smaller. The ionic radius of a cation, in other words, a metal ion, a potassium ion, like sodium ion, potassium ion, barium ion, magnesium ion. And if you compare that to an anion, such as a chloride ion, bromide ion, or iodide ion, you'll see that a cation will always have a smaller ionic radius. Now, why is this? Well, because cations are positively charged, right? Positively charged meaning they lose electrons. And when they lose electrons, there is an overall net force. The overall net nuclear charge, right? The nuclear charge was still the same. So potassium has a nuclear charge of 19 because it has 19 protons. However, it's going, this 19 proton is going to pull 18 electrons only and not 19 electrons because potassium has lost an electron. Because obviously potassium K plus losing an electron, right? So this positive charge is larger than a negative charge, which means it's gonna the nuclear is going to nucleus is gonna pull the outer electrons more strongly. Therefore, the ionic radius is obviously gonna be much smaller. So the only reasonable answer for this is A. Okay, question number four. For which equilibrium do both of the equilibrium constant Kp and Kc have no units? So no units. Remember, for there is like a there is like a rule for this, right? So you always write the product first. So if a plus b, right, a plus b makes c and d, right, makes c and d. Uh, let's say this is, has n, m, m. So this is the number of mole. N and m represent the number of moles. Okay, number of moles. So you always have to write the product first, right? The product, which is in this case C, if we're writing concentration, if we're writing concentration, uh, equilibrium of concentration, is going to be C to the power N times D to the power M, right? Divided by this one, A to the power N plus B to the power N. So this is basically the same thing. Right? So we just have to find out if they cancel each other, right? So we can start. Question number one, okay. For A, H2, right, 
hydrogen plus iodine, hydrogen iodide, okay? This is Kp. Now, the units of Kp is Pascal, per Pascal, so you have to know that, right? Um, so, Hi, right? We write Hi first, PHI, right? Because there is a 2 multiply, you write P square Hi over PHI times PI2. Now the units are basically Pascal, right? Pascal. So Pascal twice and Pascal Pascal for hydrogen and Pascal for iodine. So if you put this if you put a bracket, if you, because there are two times so it's basically a square, you can cancel it out so there's no units. So A is the correct answer. Question number five. Calcium carbide CAC C A C two reacts with water as shown. The data above the equation is in kilojoules. The standard enthalpy of formation of the compounds are involved. What is the standard enthalpy change of the reaction shown? Now for this one, you have to draw as Hess cycle. Okay, so we are going to go with the standard enthalpy of formation. So delta del HF. Okay, so we're going to re rewrite this equation, CAC2, right, H2O. We are asked to find the enthalpy change, which is delta HR. We are asked to find this. So what we have to think of the elements which make up these products and reactants. So calcium, hydrogen, and oxygen, right, and oxygen. And because there's only one oxygen on both sides, we have uh, two. Okay, so these are the reactants or the constituent elements, right, because delta HF formation Right, the form the enthalpy of formation definition is is that when one is the enthalpy of change when one mole of compound right is formed from its constituent elements. In this case, calcium, hydrogen, and oxygen are the constituent elements. Now this is gonna give, be our del H reactant, del H reactant, and this is gonna be a del H formation product, formation reactant. So we are given the enthalpy of formation of calcium carbide, our water, calcium oxide, and C2H2. So for a half cycle, we have to always use this arrow. We have to follow the arrow direction. So here, we can draw the graph like this, right? We can go around, we can go a looping like this, okay? so. You'll notice that this arrow is going downwards, right? And this arrow is going upwards. So we have to take this as this delta H as negative. And because this arrow is going upwards, and this arrow is also going upwards in the same direction, we have to take this as positive. So this is kind of basically like math in like vectors, right? In mathematics, it's basically like the vectors principle. So if you take that into account, this is going to be delta H f of the product is going to minus the delta h f of the reactant right so this is going to be this is going to be so delta h r the enthalpy change of reaction is going to be brackets minus 635 so product first right product minus 635 plus 228 bracket minus minus 60 and minus minus 286 now this will give us an answer of minus 61 kilojoule per mole you can put that into your calculator and you get minus 61 kilojoules per mole right question number six in sodium chloride lattice, the number of chloride ions that surround each sodium ion is called the coordination number of sodium ions. What are the coordination number of sodium ions and chloride ions in sodium chloride lattice? Now in the sodium chloride lattice, I want you to draw. Draw a cube, right? You, it's always better to draw a diagram if you don't understand it. Draw a cube, right? And in the middle, let's suppose in the middle, there is the, the sodium ion. And then chlorine, chlorine, the chloride ion, is going to surround the, 
the the sodium ion in all different directions. So, up, sorry. So, above and below the plane. So there's gonna be one chlorine atom here, one chlorine atom down here. Left and right, chlorine atom here, chlorine atom there. Front and back, chlorine atom here, chlorine atom here. So how many chlor chlorine atoms are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. So there are six chloride ions surrounding um, a sodium ion. So the coordination number of chloride ions is going to be six, right? But how many sodium ions are there? Right. How many sodium ions are there? So it's going to be six as well. Because if you try to draw this in this that is structure, for example, this one. So you can see that each sodium ion represent there is actually two more chlorine ions. So if we if we look at this, right? If you didn't understand this, you can also check this diagram because each sodium ion is surrounded by six chloride ions here. If you check this part, there's actually one chlorine atom in the front and one chlorine atom at the back. Right. Now if we read the question carefully, the the detail that we are given, the clue that we are given is that the number of chloride ions, right? The number of chloride ions that surround each sodium ion is called the coordination number of sodium ions. Right. So the coordination number of sodium ions is the same as the number of chloride ions that surrounds each sodium ion. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six. Therefore, there are six chlorine, chloride ions. Okay? And therefore, we have to, the correct answer should be C. I hope you get that. Question 7. Histidine is an amino acid. What are the approximate bond angles 1, 2, and 3? Well, this is, you have to use Vesper theory. Right, the bond angle theory. So this theory states that lone pair, lone pair has the greatest amount of repulsion. Lone pair, bond pair has the second amount, right? And bond pair, bond pair of electrons have the least amount of repulsion. So using the basic principle of Vesper theory, we can now know whether one, we can now approximate or kind of guess whether one, two, and three, the bond angles of one, two, and three. Okay, so for number one, we can see that there is a sp2 hybridized carbon atom, sp2 hybridized, right, and it's in this shape. So we can kind of say, and there's also no lone pair, right, there's no lone pair of in the central carbon atom. That's a very big clue, no lone pair on central carbon atom. What does this mean? Well, this means that it's going to be a trigonal planar shape, right? The, the double bond doesn't, you have to see the double bond as like a single bond, right? The double bond doesn't really affect it, but yeah, the bond angle is going to be approximately 120. Now, if you notice, BF3 or BCL3, BF3, boron fluoride, boron trifluoride, is also the same shape. Right? So it's going to have a 120 degree angle for number one. For number two, uh, this is nitrogen, right? Nitrogen has a valency of five, right? There's five outer electrons. So one bond pin here, one bond pin here, one bond pin with a carbon. However, we still need two more, right? So nitrogen actually has a lone pair, right? There is a lone pair on the central, central nitrogen atom. So what does this look like? 
So it's not going to be 120 because there's a lone pair here. The lone pair is going to repel, repel this two bond angle to smaller degree angles. So how is it going to look like? Well, it's kind of the same as ammonia if you think about it because ammonia also have a lone pair. Now in this case, the three H's are 1H, 1H, and 1C comment. So it's going to be something like this. H. H and C. So it's going to be somewhere around 107 degree angle. And 3 obviously is a tetrahedral shape because carbon always form 4 bonds. Carbon, single carbon bond is sp3 hydroxide, so it's always 109.5. So B is the correct answer. Question 8. The contact process takes place at the pressure between 100 kilopascal and 200 kilopascal. A catalyst is used. Which statement is correct? Okay. The contact process, right, is a process to manufacture sulfuric acid, right? So, statement A. A V2O5 catalyst is added to increase the equilibrium of yield of the reaction. This is wrong because a catalyst cannot increase the yield. It can only increase the rate. B. Changes in pressure has no effect on the position of equilibrium. Now we can write the equation, if you remember the contact process equation is SO2, sulfur dioxide, it's going to react with oxygen, turning it into sulfur trioxide, right? Right? So we can actually make it like this, so it will balance it out. Okay. So there are three moles this side, two moles this side. So if you increase the pressure, or decrease the pressure as a matter of fact, it can change the yield. It can change the position of equilibrium. So this is actually wrong as well. The equilibrium yield of the reaction is very high under the conditions used. Between 100 kilopascal and 200 kilopascal. Yes, if you use a high pressure, right, a high, using a high pressure shifts the equilibrium to the side with lower number of moles. So there are lower number of moles or lower number of volume of gas in the right hand side. Therefore, the pressure is, the equilibrium is going to shift to the right. So C is the correct answer. Question number nine. Bromine reacts with sodium at hydroxide at 25 degrees Celsius. Reaction one, reaction two. The NOBR form is unstable at 25 degrees Celsius. React further. Which reactions are dispro disproportionation? Okay. So this is very similar with the experiment. If you, in your syllabus, you have learned with chlorine and sodium hydroxide but in this case you're just replacing chlorine with bromine everything stays the same okay with 25 degrees celsius this is cold right this is cold NaOH meaning you're going to form this compound so we can write it like this okay right you're only going to form this compound right NaBro or you can write OBR this is a more accurate way but you can also write this this way which reaction are disproportionate? Okay, so bromine, right, has zero, oxygen state of zero, and sodium bromide has, in here, it has negative one, right? So it is obviously a reduction. Mm -hmm. And in here, sodium, uh, oxygen has an oxidation state of negative two, sodium has plus one, so bromine is also going to be plus one, so that it all becomes neutral. So it's going to be plus 1. And this is oxidation. An increase in oxidation number is oxidation. Okay. So reaction 1 is definitely disproportionate. Okay. How about reaction 2? Now in here, any OBR, same thing. Negative 2. Oxygen is negative 2. Sodium is plus 1. So bromine is also plus 1. And here NaBr minus one, and here NaBrO three, right? So sodium is now going to be negative two times three because there are three o sodium oxygen atom. So oxygen is going to be negative six. Sodium is going to be plus one as usual. So bromine is going to be plus five. So plus one to negative is reduction because there is a decrease in oxidation state, and from plus one to plus five, this is oxidation because there's an increase in the oxidation state. Therefore. Both reaction number one and reaction number two are disproportionate reaction. And disproportionate, disproportionate means to undergo oxidation and 
reduction stimulate uh, simultaneously, right, of the same species. Question number 10, which statement is correct? The relative atomic mass of CL35 is 35.5. 30, now this is wrong because look at this, they already give you 35. So it's going to be 35, right? It's not going to be 35.5, the relative AR, right? So A is wrong. The relative formula mass of CaCO3 is 100.1. Now we can work it out if you use the periodic table, use periodic table at the back. So I have done it for you. So calcium is 40.1, carbon is 12, and oxygen is 16 times 3. That's going to give us 100.1. Therefore, B is the correct answer. Okay. 11. Iodine and propanone react according to the following equation. If the concentration of propanone is increased, propanone is this one, Keeping the total reaction volume constant, the initial rate of reaction also increases. What could be the reason of this? Well, this is increasing concentration. What happens when you increase concentration? Well, the rate is going to increase. When rate increase, what is going to happen? The frequency, right, the frequency of effective collisions are going to increase. Okay, so let's look at the statement. Statement A. A greater proportion of collisions are successful at higher concentration. Now this is wrong. We cannot say for sure that they will be successful because there's always a chance that some particles will be successful, some particles will not be successful. So we can't say this. Okay, so question number B. The particles are farther apart at higher concentration. No, the particles are very near to each other at higher concentration. The particles have more energy. They do not have. This energy is only um, related with kinetic energy and related with temperature. A change in temperature only makes a change in energy of the particles. So C is not correct, and this is also D. More collisions per second means the same thing as frequency of effective collision at high temperature, high concentration. Question 12. Four successive ionization energy of element E are shown. In element E is in periodic 3 of the periodic table, so always again look at the periodic table. In which group of the periodic table is E? So now you can see that there is, okay, there is no large jump between these two, between the 5th, 6th, and 7th, and 8th ionization energy. There is no large jump because there are about an increase of 4,000 to 5,000 range, right? So there is no large jump. Now, if there is no large sum that in the eighth ionization energy, right, in the period number three, so it cannot be, there is no ninth ionization energy, right? I mean, there can be, but we're only given five, fifth, six, seven, and eight. So what does this mean? There is no large jump if you remove the fifth electron. If you remove the sixth electron, there's no jump. If you remove the seventh electron, there's no jump. If you remove the eighth electron, there's no jump. So what could this be? Now, this could be, we could, so we have to look at backwards, right? We have to look at them backwards. There is no large jump, so we have to look at it backwards. So it cannot be 15, 16, 17, because this is group 15, it basically has five outer electrons, six outer electrons, seven outer electrons. So there are no large jump between fifth, sixth, and seventh. So it can only be A, 14. So there must be something before the fourth ionization energy has to be a large jump to get to the fifth ionization energy. Okay. Question 13. In this question, you should assume the gas form behaves as an ID gas. 1.7 gram of mag magnesium reacts with 50 centimeter cube of 2.2 mole per decimeter cube, hydrochloric acid at this temperature and pressure. Which volume of gas is produced and measured under these uh, conditions? Well, this is basically a P equals, PV equal NRT question, right? PV equal NRT. If you see ideal gas, you should always write down this equation and then solve from this, from this, okay? So we're given the temperature, we're given the pressure, we're given the, um, we're given the mass of magnesium and the volume and the concentration of hydrochloric acid. So we can find the mole, right, the mole of hydrochloric acid. So this is equal to, right, this is equal to, wait, 
let me write it down here uh, mole is equal to concentration times volume so this is going to be 2.2 right 2.2 mole per dm cube times 50 times 10 to 1 minus 3 because this is in centimeters we have to change it into decimeter cube for the units to cancel out so this gives us number of moles of HCl is going to give us 0 0.11 mole. Now if we write the equation of this, right, magnesium and HCl, you see that there is magnesium chloride and hydrogen. You'll see that there is a 1 is to 2 ratio between magnesium and hydrochloric acid. So according to the mole ratio the mole of magnesium is going to be half of the mole of hydrochloric acid so this is going to be 0 0.11 divided by 2 this is going to be 0 0.055 mole so if there is 0 0.055 mole there is going to be how many there's going to be right the mole of hydrogen is going to be 0 0.055 as well because it is 1 is 2 one okay it is one is to one one is to one okay now we can use the pv equal nrt formula so v is equal to nrt because we find the volume of hydrogen over p so we know the hydrogen number mole of hydrogen is 0 0.55 so 0 0.5 0 0.055 times the molar constant the the gas constant 8.31 times 303 the pressure change it into pascal okay this will give us 1.25 times 10 to the power minus 3 note that the answer is given in meter cube in meter cube so you have to convert it into dm cube by multiplying it with 10 to the power 3 right so this will give us 1.254 dm cube approximately 1.3 dm cube therefore the correct answer should be A. Okay, so I hope you got that. Question number 14. Chlorine dioxide, CoCl2, reacts with sodium hydroxide to produce water and mixture of two salts, NaCl2 and NaCO2. What is the mole ratio of NaClO2 and NaCO2 in the product mixture? Okay, for this we can use, right, we can use the, we can have to write down this equation. Okay, so um, C... ClO2 plus NaOH, right, producing water, NaClO2. Okay, we're going to make this a little bit smaller. Right, and then we're going to produce um, NaClO3. Now let's we we you can balance it using the usual way, uh we can also use the oxidation uh, oxidation way right I like to use oxidation way so let's do that so there's minus four here so chlorine has an oxidation of plus four now here is minus four so it's plus one so oxidation of chlorine here is plus three plus one minus six this is plus five okay so we can draw plus four to plus three one electron there's a change of one electron and plus four to plus five there's also a change in one electron meaning we have a one-to-one -one ratio of NaClO and NaClO3 so C is the correct answer question number 15 the temperature of a sample of inert gas is increased so temperature is increases what effect does this have on the number of moles over the most probable energy and the most of higher energy? Okay, this is, uh, we have to look at the Bo Boltzmann distribution, the Boltzmann distribution, okay? Well, the Boltzmann distribution, you have to notice that it will, the graph will look something, something, something like this. So, when the peak is highest, right, so this is the molecular, molecular energy, this is the number of molecules or particles. So, when the when there is like a peak, right? There is the the highest peak on the graph, is the most probable energy. Right, and when temperature increases, what happens to the graph? Well, the Boltzmann distribution, the Boltzmann graph, is going to be shifted to the right. Now you have to remember this as well. It will be shifted to the right. So the new graph is going to look something like this. 
so there is a lower right there is a lower probable energy the peak decreases so there is a lower probable energy with most probable energy right so it will decreases from here to here however the number of molecules with higher energy with higher energy will increase why because here if the activation energy was here and it was here there's a higher area right you see compared to the lower area of this one higher area this means more number of molecules with higher energy therefore b is the correct option okay 16. For which compound is there a greatest percentage loss of mass on strong heating? Okay. So for this one, we have to write uh this one. We have to write this one. CaCO3 turned into CaO plus CO2. Right? Always write on the formula if you don't know. Okay. Uh for this one it's kind of like trial and error, you know. Um it cannot be carbonate. Why? Because carbonate, right, when carbonate decomposes the they only produce carbon dioxide. Now the loss of mass will always be gases, right? When nitrates and carbonate decompose, they always release, release gases. So carbonate is only one gas is released. But if nitrates, right? If nitrates are are decomposed, nitrates for example, magnesium nitrate, okay, magnesium nitrate, is going to form magnesium oxide, but there will be two gases. So there will be a higher, like a greater percentage of loss of mass, if you think about it, right? So A and C cannot be the correct answer anymore. Okay, and then we can balance this equation. So the mass scheme says it's D. So we can, oh, we can go directly to D. Go directly to D, and actually balance this out first. Always remember to balance it out first. Okay, and then we will have to find. The greatest percentage loss of mass. Okay. So we can assume that one hundred percent, right, is basically one hundred grams. Okay? So NO2 plus O2, right? We don't know how much NO2 plus O2 is. So if there is a hundred grams of magnesium nitrate, right? Magnesium nitrate. How many moles are there? We know the MR, you find the MR of magnesium nitrate, okay? Using the periodic table, this is 11483. One, one, so we can find the mole, which is mass over MR. So if the mass was theoretically, let's suppose it's 100 grams, it's going to be 148.3. This is going to be 0 0.674 moles. 0 0.674 moles of magnesium nitrate. Okay? So... Magnesium oxide will also have 0 0.67, 4 moles. However, there are 5, you see, here. There are actually 5 moles here, is it not? And then, so we can multiply this mole, right? We can actually multiply 0 0.674 times... 24.3 times plus 16. Now, 24.3 is the magnesium oxide. This is the MR of magnesium oxide. So when you want to find the mass, right? When you want to find the mass, is you just multiply mole times the MR. So this will give us a mass of magnesium oxide is, is around 27.1217. Okay? So... Greatest percentage loss of mass, so original 100, okay, and remaining mass is 27.17 over 100 times 100 is equal to 72.8%. This is the highest one, so D, the mass scheme says D, so it is D. You can also try for other one, using the same technique as this. Okay, question 17. The solids, sodium chloride and sodium iodide, both react with concentrated sulfuric acid at room temperature. With NaCl, the products are NaHSO4 and HCl. With NaI, the products are NaHSO4, HiI2, SO2, H2, sulfur, and 
H2S. Okay, what is the explanation for the difference in the products? Well, the difference in the product is that, remember, we are reacting them with concentrated sulfuric acid, concentrated H2S of all, right? And sulfuric acid, you have to know, is an oxidizing agent. It's an oxidizing agent, okay? And then NaCl, right? NaCl contains a chloride ion. NaI contains the iodide ion. And you have to know that these he halide ions are actually reducing agents, right? Reducing agents. Right. So you can say that why in NaCl we only get two products, but with NaI we get so many different products. This is because any um I minus I the iodide ion is actually a stronger reducing agent than chloride. Right. Or you could say in a reverse argument, uh, so you can say that the the sulfuric acid is not a powerful enough oxidizing agent to oxidize the chloride ion, right? So that would be also a valid explanation. So the explanation that matches step question 17 is C, because iodide ions are better reducing agents than chloride ions. And you have to know that the order goes down from Cl minus Br minus I minus, so right. As you go down the halide ions, the reducing, they become effective more effective reducing agents. Okay, question 18. SiO2 has a melting point of 1713, okay? It reacts with hot NaOH to form sodium silicate. Sodium silicate and water. No reaction occurs when SiO2 is added to hot sulfuric acid. What can be deduced from this information? Well, well, SiO2 has a very high melting point, right? It has a high melting point. We can write it has a high melting point, right? It reacts with hot NaOH, right? SO2 is actually an acidic oxide because, right, acidic oxide. It reacts with a base or an alkali to form sodium silicate and water. Okay, so we can write this equation, SiO2 plus NaOH producing salt and water. Right, so because it's reacting with a base, we can deduce that it is an acid, it producing as salt and water, right? So we can see the chemical behavior of SiO2 is acidic. The structure of SiO2 has to be giant. Why? Because it has a high melting point. Specifically, SiO2 is actually a giant, giant covalent structure, right? Giant covalent. So C is actually the correct answer. Question 19. Element X has the second largest atomic radius in its period. An atom of X has three occupied electron shells. The oxide of X is shaken with water. What is the What could be the pH of the resulting solution? Well, you have to know that as you go across the period, the atomic radius actually decreases. Atomic radius actually decreases. Why? Because the proton number increases, right, as you go from left to right. The proton number increases. So if the proton number increases, there is a stronger uh, nuclear attractive force um, for the outer electrons, for the valence electrons. So you can say that uh, the atomic radius would decrease when you go across the group. And then it there is a very big clue. A very big clue here is that an atom of X has three occupied electron shells. Three occupied electron shells meaning, meaning N is equal to three. So it is in period three, okay? It is in period three. So you can use the PR cable to see in where, uh, in period three, the element has to be in period three. It has the second largest atomic radius in its group. Second largest atomic radius. So the law, as you go across the period, the atomic radius will decrease. So it has to be on the left hand side, right? So in the left hand side, the atomic radius is actually larger, right? So the first one, the first one of the period 3 is actually sodium. So after sodium is magnesium. So the element has to be magnesium. It has to be the second largest, right? Sodium is the, f the largest um, atomic radius. So this magnesium oxide, an oxide of X is shaken with water. This is going to produce magnesium hydroxide, right? Magnesium hydroxide. Okay, what is the resulting pH? This pH is around pH 9 pH 9 to 10, right? So magnesium oxide, C. Question 20. Which emission from an internal combustion engine contributes to the erosion of marble statues? Well, the emission of nitrogen dioxide, right? Nitrogen dioxide, 
right? Nit nitrous oxide, sulfur, uh, sulfur dioxide, right? Sulfur dioxide. But in the internal combustion engine, only nitrogen dioxide are produced, not sulfur dioxide. Therefore, nitrogen dioxide actually reacts with water to form nitric acid. And this is the substance that actually erodes the marble statue. So nitric acid, therefore, C is the correct answer. Okay, question 21. The diagram shows the melting point of eight elements with consecutive atomic numbers, which could be sodium. Okay. For this, you actually have to know the um, the melting points of the element of the eight elements. So the atomic number. Okay. So we can see, we can actually see there's a rising trend, right? As you go across a period, as you go across a period, they become non-metal from metals from left to non-metal. So the cons general consensus is that. You have to, uh, you the melting point is going to decrease right from metal to non-metal, so we can actually start from B. We can actually start from B. So B looks like an element, right? It's gonna start from. Let's say, B is sodium, C is, sorry, B is not sodium, uh, but we can say that B is something else, right? Okay, so we can say that okay, we can start from here, C. Right, so this large jump over here, this these things have to be metals, right? Because they are increasing melting point. But in non-metal, it will then decrease. So this has to be a non-melting point. Right, so these are metals and these are non-metals, right? The, on the other side, they are non-metals. So we can say definitely say, right, if we look at the periodic table, we can say that this is, you can start from um, neon, for example. Right, so this could be neon because neon they have noble gases, remember. Noble gases gases have the the lowest melting point. Right, lowest melting point. So B and A could be um the gases for neon, right? And because it's in sodium it has to be in element period number three, right? But for this certain one, neon is in period number two, right? Period number two, number two. But this graph is kind of strange, so this is a challenging question for you. So neon, and then it's going to go to sodium, to the next period, right? Next period, and then it's going to be magnesium, aluminum, right? And here, there's the barely a change in melting point, because magnesium and aluminum are very similar, right? And then silicon, why? Because obviously, silicon forms a giant covalent structure, so it has a high melting point. And then it drops down, because it is a non-metal, so here it's going to be phosphorus and it's going to be sulfur right now the reason why sulfur has a high melting point than uh, phosphorus is because sulfur actually is exists in the form of s8 right at room temperature sulfur exists in this form with six eight sulfur sulfur molecules and phosphorus remember it exists at room temperature p4 molecules and which molecule is bigger? Obviously, S8, the one with higher um, atomic mass, right? So, it, which means there's a larger number of electrons, more ID, ID force, which means sulfur actually has a higher melting point than phosphorus. Okay, well, so we know sodium is going to be C, definitely. Okay, now this was a challenging question, I could say. Um, question 22. The boiling points of Br2, ICl, IBr are given in the table, which rule explains why the boiling point of ICl is greater than Br2, why the boiling point of IBr is greater than ICl. Now, for this one, we actually have to consider two things. We have to consider whether the molecule is polar or nonpolar. Right. And we also have to consider the dipoles. Okay. Firstly, let's check. Why is ICL greater than Br2? Well, Br2 is a nonpolar molecule because it is made out of Br and Br. It's, th it's the same element. So the electronegativity is the same. There's no difference in electronegativity. This is a pure non covalent compound. However, ICL, there's a difference between ICL because Cl is closer to fluorine. Cl is going to be negative. I is going to be slightly positive. So it's going to be a polar molecule. And generally, polar molecules have higher boiling points, higher melting points than nonpolar compounds. Right. And so they have permanent dipoles. We call these permanent dipoles, right? Permanent dipoles. 
Okay, so second, why is the boiling point of IBL greater than ICL? Well, for this one, we actually have to, f we actually have to think of another kind of force, which is called the, the van, van der Waals force, van der Waals force. Specifically, we are talking about the ID ID force, the instantaneous dipole and induced dipole forces, because IBR, remember BR has a high atomic. Uh, atomic mass than ICL, right? So there are more electrons in IBR. This means higher um, ID ID force, right? ID ID force depends on the at higher atomic mass and number of electrons. So we can see the one that matches is B because ICL has permanent dipoles, IBR has stronger instantaneous dipole and induced dipoles than ICL, right? They both are, however, polar. They both polar, so we have to think of another force, which is ID ID force, one of the Van der Waals force. Okay, I hope you get this. Question twenty three: A solution contains both magnesium and strontium at the same concentration. The solution is divided into two equal portions: aqueous sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is added dropwise first, and then dilute sulfuric acid is added dropwise to the other portion. Which rule is correct? Okay, so magnesium two plus plus as well minus two plus. A solution contains both of this, okay? Um, firstly, we're going to add sodium hydroxide, right? Sodium hydroxide. So it's going to form magnesium hydroxide, right? Without hydroxide, right? And then when precipitate first seen, okay? The precipitate first seen when NaOH is added is we're going to see magnesium hydroxide. We won't see strontium hydroxide. Sorry, twice. Um, the, and the reason is because strontium hydroxide is more soluble, more soluble than magnesium hydroxide. And this comes, this question tells you whether you know the solubilities of the N. As you go down the period, as you go down the group, right, down the group two, if, as you go down, for example, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, as you go down the group, the hydroxide solub solubilities of hydroxide actually increases. However, however, solubility of sulfate actually decreases. So if the solubility actually decreases, this means we can see a hydro uh, we can see a precipitate, right? So magnesium hydroxide, obviously the first in the group, so it's gonna be seen as a precipitate and, there, and when we add sodium um, when we add sulfuric acid right we are making a so uh, this metal and sulfate ion right so magnesium sulfate and and strontium sulfate strontium is actually below magnesium and remember solubility of sulfate decreases therefore strontium sulfate is actually going to be seen as a precipitate so B is the correct answer 24 structural isomerism and stereo isomerism should be considered when answering this question Okay. Okay. So, if a molecule contains two non-identical chiral carbons, four optical isomers exist. How many isomers are there? With a molecular formula of C7H14O and a five-member ring and a tertiary alcohol group. Okay. So, this question we have to consider structural and stereo isomers. Okay. So, for these kinds of organic questions, it's better to always draw. Right, always draw the things that you're asking. So we want a molecular formula, right? We want a molecular C seven H fourteen O. Right, and then we want it to be a tertiary alcohol group with a five member ring. So it's going to be something like this, right? Five member ring. So let's try to draw this. Um. So let's try to draw this. Okay. So firstly, uh, one of the shapes we're going to get is going to be like this. 5 member ring, right? It has to be a tertiary alcohol. So it's going to be here, alcohol, and here. Now this is a CH3 group. There's one carbon, two, okay, let me draw it in different colors. So one carbon, two, three, four, five, six, right? We have six carbon. We still need one more, so we can write it here draw one more here so here is another CH3 group um, but if you we just draw it as a stick so you don't actually know there's a CH3 group there so there's actually one more 
7. So we have the formula C7H14O. Oh, I'm not going to count it, but it has the same molecular formula. You can count it as well. Okay. So this is our first isomer because this is also a tertiary carbon. There's a carbon here. There's a carbon here. And this carbon, this alcohol group is connected to 1, 2, 3. Three other alkyl groups. Therefore, this is a tertiary alcohol. So we have our first isomer here. Okay. This methyl group, we can actually add it in different ways, right? We can see if there's a chiral here or not. And we also want it to contain a chiral carbon. Okay, so we can see chiral carbon. Okay. So here we have three different groups. One different, two, three, four. There's different groups. So this is a chiral carbon. And this is also a chiral carbon because here we have a CH3 group. Uh, and the side chain over here, so the side chain over here is not symmetrical. And we also actually have one more H. So they have four different groups, which means there are, um, uh, there is a, so there is chiral, right? Chiral carbon. And remember, if there is a chiral carbon, there is going to be a pair of enantiomers, optical isomers, right? Optical isomers exist as a pair. So if there is one chiral carbon, there are two pairs. So 2 times 2, we already get 4. So this is our first isomer, right? Now you may be asking, there is also another type, right? Another type. So if I draw this, there's another isomer. Okay, if we draw this, we draw the OH again because it's the same. We need a tertiary. However, in this case, we're going to move the methyl group, this group. We're going to move this group. And we're going to move it here. If we move it here, it's going to be different than this one. Right, because the carbon atom at in which it is attached is going to be different now. So there is actually going to be another chiral carbon. If we count the chiral carbon, there's going to be one here again and one here again. Because there is two different, two different side chain. Two different side chains over here one here and a hydrogen here that is not in the picture so we have two this means two times two this is equal to four there's another four isomers here because there is four optical isomers here four optical isomers there right and then you might be asking why this one there is actually another one that you confuse so you can draw this draw OH again draw here Okay, and if you draw it here, it's going to be the same as this. Because this is basically the same shape, right? This is basically the same shape. If you flip it in the mirror, it's the same thing, right? So these do not count as isomers, it's the same thing. Okay, there's one more isomer left. One more isomer, if we take, um, instead of a methyl group, we can take an ethyl group, right? Instead of this group, we can take an ethyl group. So we can draw... And draw this right and then we can draw an OH right an OH over here and instead of right we have one two three four five we still need two more instead of methyl we're gonna in here we're gonna branch it out to make gonna branch it out to make ethyl so one two three four five six seven so this is actually a CH2 CH3 group ethyl group instead of methyl group. So there is actually a chiral carbon over here. Right, there's only sorry, this is not a chiral carbon, right? We only have one here. So this is going to be one isomer over here. So there's one isomer here, one isomer there. I'm sorry, this one this one is not a chiral carbon. This carbon atom is not a chiral. This is not chiral. Now why you may ask this is because look at this there is one group here right one a different type of group there and now we have to look at the side chain if you look at it here if i draw this here from this carbon you will see that it is symmetrical you'll see that it is symmetrical you see that this side is the same as this side and therefore, if two sides, if there are two groups that are the same, we cannot say that this is a chiral carbon. We only have one or more isomer. We only have one more isomer left. So four, four, one, 
12 plus 4 plus 1. This is 9 isomers in total. This is a structural isomer. This is chiral. Um, this is optical, stereo isomers. So we have 9 isomers in total. So this was a little bit challenging, yes. 25. Which reagent will react with pentane 3 or to give a mixture of isomers, stereo isomers? Okay, for this question, right, pentane 3 or Let's try to try to draw pentane three or the pentane meaning five carbon is going to be a five carbon ring, a five carbon chain, and it's going to be pentane three all. So this three indicates where the, the hydroxyl group is. All right. So this is a secondary alcohol to give a mixture of stereoisomers. Okay. Which reagent will react? Okay. So. Secondary alcohol will react with potassium dichromate. Potassium dichromate is an oxidizing agent. Okay, so when secondary alcohol is reacted with potassium dichromate, it's going to oxidize this alcohol into a ketone. Right. And if we draw this ketone, it's going to be one, two. Okay, I can, can I, I'm going to erase the top one. Okay, it's going to give us one, two, three, four, five. And instead of this O, we're going to get a ketone group there. And this is not, uh, this is not chiral carbon because there's the same groups on the change on the central carbon atom, right? So this first option can be eliminated. Second option, we are going to react it with concentrated sulfuric acid. Now reacting with concentrated sulfuric acid is the same as this a uh, dehydration reaction, right? Dehydration reaction, which means we are removing water molecules from here. Okay, so. How are we going to remove the, the molecule? So we're removing one OH group. We're removing the alcohol group. And then we are removing the... Okay, so there's actually CH2 over here. CH2 over here. We are removing the adjacent, right? Always remember, we are removing the adjacent one hydrogen atom from the adjacent carbon. At carbon. So you can remove it from here, or you can remove it from here. It really matters where you remove it from. So if you remove it from here, you're going to OH, you remove OH, you remove one hydrogen, you get water, right? So we're removing one molecule of water. This is called a dehydration reaction. So when an alcohol turns into an alkene, this is a dehydration reaction using concentrated sulfuric acid. Okay, so when you remove it, it's very essential that you add, you add a double bond here, right? Because you are removing the, you're removing the water molecule. So you have to add a double bond here. So the final structure is going to look something like CH, so B, right, because there's an H over here, that's where we get the H, so this is CH, CH3, right. And will this give a mixture of stereoisomerism? It will, because here, in this type, this type is actually a cis trans, right? A cis trans or a geometrical isomerism. It is not an optical isomerism. So there is no chiral carbon here. So if we write it in here, if we write it CH2, CH3, H over here, H over here, see we have different groups on either side. We have different groups on either side of the carbon atom. So this is going to give us a cis trans, a geometrical isomerism. Therefore, B is the right answer. Okay. So I hope you understand that. Question 26. An organic molecule, organic molecule contains three carbon atoms. It requires 4.5 molecules of oxygen to complete oxidation. What could it be? Okay, for complete oxidation, you're gonna produce carbon dioxide and water always. Okay, carbon dioxide and water always. An organic molecule containing three carbon atoms. So we don't know what this is. So this is a trial and error question. So we actually just have to balance the equation, right? This is a fix, uh, the fix, we are given this fixed information. So we cannot change this 4.5 molecules, okay? And we're also gonna change the molar ratio, W, okay? So, let's start with propane, C3H8. It's going to add, 4.5 is the same as 9.9 by 2, right? 9 by 2 oxygen, right? 4.5 molecules of oxygen, 9 by 2. And then you react it with CO2, and H2O. Now, if you balance this out, you get three here and four here, right? Only three carbon atom we point is four point five. Right, as you can see, this molecule this doesn't balance it out. So there are actually what 
there are actually nine oxygen atoms here. There is six oxygen atom here. There is four oxygen and there is ten oxygen atom here. So it does not match. So we cannot say we can eliminate A. Now let's go to B. This is CH3, CH, sorry, propanoic acid. So this is, the formula is given c 3 h O 2 This is cnh 2 n O 2 This, it follows this general formula. Okay. Anyways, we are going to react with 9 by 2 oxygen, and then we're going to form carbon dioxide and water. As always, we can always um, check this. So there is 10 oxygen here again. There's only... There's 9 oxygen here, there's actually 11 oxygen in this side, so this is also wrong. So B is also a wrong option. Okay, so next we have to take propanone. Now propanone is c 3 h 6 O. You have to know the general formula for this as well. 9 by 2 O2 is going to form carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So it's going to give us 3, 3, right? How about if you check this one, it's not the same as well. It's not the same... Um, it's not balanced, right? There's nine oxygen here, one oxygen here, there's six oxygen here, there's nine oxygen there's nine oxygen here in total, and there's ten oxygen in the left hand side. So it's not equal, so we can eliminate this. So D is the correct answer. And I'll also show you how D is the correct answer. Okay. So C three propanol. Right. So C three H eight O plus nine by two. O2 equal 3 CO2 plus 4 H2. So check three carbon atoms, right? Eight hydrogen on both sides. One, nine, so there's 10 oxygen here. There is six oxygen here, four oxygen here, so 10 oxygen here. So it matches. So D is the answer. Okay. Question 27. Which equation represents a reaction that proceeds through initi initiation, propagation, and termination steps? Now, this is a free radical substitution reaction. Which equation represents a reaction? Okay. Free radical substitution, we have to obviously use a radical. Radical. So, A is the correct answer. Why? Because this is actually chlorination. Chlorination. You have to know that alkanes, right? Alkanes will react with chlorine, right? Alkanes undergo chlor uh, chlorination under UV light, right? So CO2 actually breaks down into two chlorine, chlorine, chlorine radical, free radicals. And then it forms C4H9CO plus HCl. That's free radical substitution. So it is a correct answer. And B is not the correct answer because it's not a haloalkane. We always have to start from an alkane, right? This is not an alkane, this is an alkene, this is an aldehyde, so it's wrong. Okay. 28. Structural isomerism and stereoisomerism should be considered when answering this question. A set of isomeric hydrocarbons all contain 14.3% by mass of hydrogen, all react with bromine by addition, 0.2 grams of each hydrocarbon reacting. Okay. What is the maximum number of isomeric combined inside? Okay, for this question, this question was found very tricky. Okay, when I when I solve when I first solved it, it was kind of, it was really difficult. I couldn't solve it, so it took me several uh, minutes of thinking to actually get this answer. Okay, so we are given what are we given? A set of isomeric hydrocarbons, right? Hydrocarbons meaning only carbon and hydrogen atoms, which means this can only be alkanes or alkenes, right? And it says there is isomeric, isomeric. Now alkanes do not form isomers. Uh, they not they do not form. Um, um, I mean they do form isomers, but they do not form these geometrical isomers or optical isomers, right? Okay, so we have to check alkenes. So it could be likely it's going to be alkenes. Okay. Okay, so bromine by addition. Uh, bromine by addition reaction zero point two one. Okay. Maximum number of hydrogen. Okay. Okay, for this question, bromine, right? Bromine, Br2, one bromine is going to react it with CXH2X because it's an alkane. We don't know what structure it's going to be. Right? Okay. We don't know whether it's an alkane or not, but first we have to check this 
okay, we are given 14 by 3 mass of hydrogen. So it's a carbon, hydrocarbon, so it only contains carbon and hydrogen, right? So we can say the general formula of alkenes and alkenes are basically CH2, right? Because C2H4 is, when you simplify it down, you the empirical formula is CH2, right? The empirical formula is CH2. This is the empirical formula. So we will use this empirical formula to find the number of carbon atoms and hydrogen, okay? So, uh, we're given... Okay, we have to first find the moles, right? The moles of bromine, right? The moles of bromine, because we're given the mass, right, in bromine, Br2. So moles of bromine is equal to the 0 0.799 divided by 15.9.8. So this is the AR, right? Atomic mass of bromine. This is going to give us an answer of 5 times 10 to the power minus 3 moles, okay? And CH2, CH2, so it's going to be in a 1 to 2 ratio, right? It's going to be in a 1 to 2 to ratio. So if there is 14.3% by mass of hydrogen, from 100%, how many are there of carbon? So we just minus 14.3. This is going to give us 85.7%. This is going to be 85.7 grams of, and 14.3 grams of hydrogen. Okay. And then we can divide it by 12, by the, this is the mass, this is the MR, we can find the mole if we divide it both by 1, so this is going to give us 7.14, 14.2, and therefore this is a 1 is to 2 reaction, C, therefore it is a CH2, right? So this is going to be, but if we divide it, if we divide this and then we are divided by the smallest, right? If we divide it by smallest, which is 7.14, this is 1, 7.14, this is going to give us 1, 2. So the, the atom is going to be CH2, right? The, the empirical formula is going to be CH2. Okay. So if there is one mole of this, there will be one mole of this as well. So there will be 5 times 10 to the power minus 3 moles of this. So mole is equal to mass over MR. Okay, so we know that the we only find the MR. We only find the MR of the the MR of the the MR, right? Uh, we find the MR of the compound. So it's, go it's going to be zero point two eight zero two eight zero two eight zero. We have this gram of hydrocarbon, right? Two eight zero gram of hydrocarbon. And then we are going to divide by the MR, by the moles, right? By the moles to get the MR. So the mole is 5 times 10 to the power minus 3 because it reacts um, 1 is to 1, right? 1 is to 1. If there is 0 0.5 uh, times 10 to the power minus 3, there will be 0 0.5 times 10 to the power minus 3 of this hydrocarbon as well. So the MR actually gives us an MR of 56. An MR of 56. Now this can only be... This MR of 56, if you draw it out, right, if you think about it, it's going to be CNH2N, it's going to be alkene. So it could be C4H8, because 12 times 4 plus 8 is equal to 56. So this is definitely the formula that we can, C4H8. Okay, we get C4H8. We get C4H8 as our ends. We want to now find, okay, the question is asking the maximum number of isomeric compounds. Okay. Maximum number of isomers. We now we now that we know that this compound, this hydrocarbon C four H eight, we can then draw the isomer for it. Okay, maximum number. So it can be but this is butene, right? So it can be but one e, or it can be but two e. Now but one e actually does not form isomeric compounds, right? It can be but one e. It can form but two e, right? So but one e has CH three, CH two, CH, CH two. This is but one e. This is our first structural isomer. But one e. Okay. And this form with this is they will react with bromine, right? We will react with bromine for addition. So this is going to be CH three, CH two, CH. Open the double bond to this A. This is going to be Br, CH two, 
Br. Okay, so this is going to give us our first compound. Okay, our second compound is butene, right? Butene has actually two, has cis trans, right? Butene has cis trans. This is CH3, CH, CH, CH. This is butene structure, right? It has cis trans, so cis trans, so there's already two isomers within it, right? There's two isomers. One is a cis isomer, one is a trans isomer. So we already have three isomeric compounds already. Okay, and then we will react it with this one, right? CH3, HBr, CHBr, CH3. Okay, and the fourth one is actually the structure, which is C, CH2, CH3, CH3. And this is our fourth structural isomer. So if we think about it like this, there will be one, two, three, four. So there will be four isomeric compounds. So one from the but one in, two from the cis trans from two, three, and another one from the this isomer. Okay. Twenty nine. That was difficult. Twenty nine. Which um, which row describes the solvent use and time of reaction occurring when bromine reagrees and OH to form ethane? A bromoethane is a haloalkane, right? Haloalkane. It is actually a primary haloalkane. So one degree haloalkane. Reacts with NaOH to form ethane. So a haloalkane is turning into an alkane. This is actually an elimination reaction. You have to know these organic reactions by heart. Elimination reaction, right? And the condition reaction, right? The solvent that we are using is NaOH that is in ethanol, right? We cannot use any oil in water, or else it will be a hydrolysis reaction. So, A, elimination reaction. 30. Which rule contains the type of reaction that occurs when propane one all reacts to form the name carbon containing product? Okay, one chloropropane, addition, the type of reaction to form addition of propane one all. One chloro, which rule describes the type of reaction that occurs when Propane one or propane one is a one degree alcohol, right? A primary alcohol. And this can form hydro alkane. Right, you want to turn into hydro alkane. In option number eight is letting you turn into a hydro alkane. This is not an addition reaction. This is not addition reaction. This is a nucleophilic substitution reaction. You have to react with any which uh substitution. You have to react it with either PCL5, PCL3, right? SO, the, right? Or CL2. You have to react it. You have to react the alcohol to form hydro alkane. So A is not the correct answer. B carbon monoxide is by complete combustion. No carbon monoxide is the incomplete combustion. So that's wrong. Option C, propane, right? Okay, so propane 1 all. We, have, we want to turn this propane 1 all, the 1 degree alcohol, to Propane. This is an alkane, right? Propane is an alkane. So this is actually a dehydration reaction, right? We have to use concentrated sulfuric acid for that. So C is the correct answer. <coughs> Thirty-one. Which statement describe what happens when two chloro two methane methylpropanes one with NOH? So let's draw the structure. One, two, three. Propane. Two methyl. Two chloro. Okay. It's warm with NOH. NOH aqueous, which means it's going to be a hydrolysis reaction. We're going to form an hydroalkane. We're going to form uh, alcohol with this. Right, and this is a tertiary alcohol. Tertiary alcohol, right? Now, tertiary alcohol, remember, when it undergoes nucleophilic substitution with NOH, it actually undergoes with the SN1 reaction, right? SN1 pathway. So the tertiary hydroalkane reacts mostly by an S1, S1 method. So C is the correct answer. So let's look at option A quickly. The secondary hydroalkane reacts with by a mixture of an S1 and S2 mechanism. This is not a secondary alcohol. This is a tertiary alcohol. So A and B is wrong. So D, the tertiary hydroalkane does not react with hydroxide and No, they do react. Okay, they do react. So C is the correct answer. 32. How many structurally isomeric secondary alcohols are there with a the molecular form nc 5 h 2 2 Oh, so this is actually a pentanol. Pentanol. We have to draw out the structures to help us see the structural um, isomers. 
Okay, so how many isomers are there? We can draw secondary isom uh, alcohols. So we can draw five carbon atoms. One, two, three, four, five. I'm not going to draw an H because that's kind of... That's going to be very confusing. So we can put the OH here. So this is going to be pententuol. 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 Right? We also can put the OH over here. So this will be pentin 3 all, right? It will be something 3 all. So we get our first isomer here and a second isomer here already. Okay. Next, we have to think about is this isomer 1, 2, 3, 4. We can think of a branch isomer called methyl and anhydroxide here. So this is going to be uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. This is going to be 2 methyl, right? This is going to be 3 methyl, right? Butane 2 all. Right? 3 methyl butane 2 all. This is going to be our third isomer. Right? And if you draw, if you, but you, you might be asking this one, it's the same thing. These two are the same thing. Right? If you look at it, we have to use from the priority of the hydroxide group. Right? So this is the same isomer. So we only actually have only three isomers. So. Which reagent can confirm the presence of a carbonyl group, this is the CO group, in a organic compound, does not distinguish between aldehydes and ketone. Can confirm carbonyl group but does not dis distinguish between alkyne and ketone, this is definitely 2, this is going to be 2,4 DNPH solution, dinitrophenyl hydrazine reagent. And you have to remember this by heart, okay? Um, the 2,4-D and pH reagent will actually turn it into a yellow precipitate. It will form yellow precipitate or a red precipitate when there is a presence of aldehyde and ketone. Okay. 34. Which compound gives a positive test with alkaline, alkal alkaline aqueous iodine? So I2 plus NaOH. And does not show optical isomers. Does not show op optical isomers. Okay. So let's get option A. Always redraw it, always redraw it if you cannot understand it. So CH3, CO, it's going to be CH2, CH, and OH. Okay, so react with alkaline iodine. So the, if for something to react with alkaline iodine, you must have this group. You must have the CH3, CO group. It's either that or you must have the CH3, COH, H group. You must have this group. If you don't have these two group, it does not react with um, iodine. Okay, so we now know it reacts with iodine, and can we see? We cannot see any optical isomerism, right? These two atoms are the same. These two atoms are the same, right? So there's actually no optical isomerism, no optical isomerism. So A is actually the com correct compound, right? And B cannot be because it does not react with iodine form, right? C also, C actually has a chiral. Chiral, chiral carbon here. It does react positive test with aqueous iodine, but because of the ch 3 co group, but it has a chiral carbon. The question says, do not, it does not want a chiral carbon. It does not want an optical isomerism. So this is wrong. And D, obviously, is also wrong. Okay, so A is a different answer. 35. Two samples of compound X were treated separately with different reagents which were added in excess. The product of these two reactions are shown. Which reagent can be used for reaction 1 and reaction 2? Okay, for reaction 1, we can see that compound X, right? This is an aldehyde group. Aldehyde group. So you have to actually learn how to look at these, um, how to look at these um, organic structures, skeletal structures, right? So let's see, there's going to be an invisible H over here. So this is going to be aldehyde group. Now this is definitely a ketone group, right? There is actually two carbon atoms to attach. This is an alcohol group, so there's going to be a secondary alcohol. So I will... Firstly, you have to learn how to look at skeletal formulas and learn how to recognize the functional groups, okay? And the type, whether they're primary, secondary, and stuff, etc. Okay, so in reaction one, what happened? The OH group does not change, right? The ketone doesn't change. However, the aldehyde, right, the aldehyde is turned into an acid. Now, this is, aldehyde can only be oxidized with acid, so you have to use an oxidizing agent for this, okay? For reaction number two, the hydroxide doesn't change, but the ketone, Right, the ketone change, right, the ketone change from this O, CO, it changed to COH. It changed into a secondary alcohol, right? 
and this aldehyde also, aldehyde also turn into a primary alcohol. Now this is a reduction reaction. So you have to use a re reducing agent such as NaBH4, sodium borohydride, or lithium, um, lithium aluminum. Right, lithium hydrido, tetrahydrido, aluminate. Right, you can use that, those two re reagents for this. Okay, so for reaction number two, it's definitely a reducing reaction. So we are going to use NaBH four. Reaction number one is an, um, is um uh, oxidizing reaction, but notice here the ketone does not get oxidized. Right, ketone cannot be oxidized. However, the alcohol also does not get oxidized. The alcohol does not get oxidized. Therefore, we are not using a strong oxidizing agents such as sodium dichromate. We are not using a strong oxidizing agent as sodium dichromate. We are using a mild a mild oxidization. Mild oxidization. Oxidization. So we are going to use something like Tollens reagent. Tollens reagent is a, is a mild oxidizing agent. So these are the correct answer for this. Okay? Okay. 36. Which method could be used to produce prisonary acid? Okay. Number A. An acid reaction reaction involving C H three C O N A. Okay, so this is um. This is um. C. Let me draw it out again. C C C C O O minus N A plus. N plus over there. Okay, so this acid base reaction. So. Okay, so right C H three C O N A right. So the hydrolysis, okay, let's skip A first. Let's eliminate the option first. The hydrolysis of CH3, CH2, CHNA. So if you hydrolysize this, this nitrile group is going to turn into a, pent an, into a COH, right? COH group. So how many carbon atoms will be? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is going to be pentanoic acid. Obviously, B is the wrong. The acidic hydrolysis of this ester. So we have a CO group. This is an ester. So you always you can always break it break it in here so we're gonna be an acid right one two three that's gonna be a um um that's gonna be pen pentanol and uh propanol and propanoic acid right because there's three carbon atoms so this is gonna be wrong because we want butanol acid, which has four carbon atoms four carbon atoms now oxidization of this one right there are only three carbon atoms how can we oxidize this primary alcohol into an aldehyde we can't we can't do that, right? So the only answer left is A. And A is the correct answer. Okay? 37. Which ester may be hydrolyzed to produce two products, one of which may be reduced to the other? Okay. Hydrolyze. Ester may be hydrolyzed to produce one another. Okay. For this one also, you have to use a bit of thinking. Okay, first one. Uh... CH three, CH two, COOH, right? It's gonna produce. If we drop it down here, it's gonna produce an acid radical and a methanol, right? And methanol, we're gonna produce methanol. So this is a prior. It's gonna be a primary alcohol, right? Primary alcohol. So the product produce two products. These products, one of which may be reduced to the other. Can this be? Can this acid be reduced to alcohol? It can't. Now, acid can be reduced by to alcohol to primary alcohol via uh, and reducing agents such as LiAlH four. Okay. Well, we cannot do this because there are three carbon atoms. Where did the other two carbon atoms go? So we can't do that. A is the wrong answer. For B, we can also split it off from the acid and form the alcohol. So there's going to be one, two, three, four. So CH3, CH, CH2, CH3, CH3, COOH, right? And then it's going to be CH2, OH, and then it's going to be CH, CH3, CH3. So obviously the the two carbon atoms here, the two carbon atoms here, the two carbon atoms here are the same, right? This one also the same. The H is also the same. So the the 
alcohol is going to be reduced into symbol, right? So this is a correct one. This is correct. B is the correct answer. Okay. Okay, so B is the correct answer. 38. Two compounds, y, x and y, are mixed with analytical um, concentrated sulfuric acid is added. As there are eggs found by reaction of resulting mixture of products. Okay. Which two compounds could be X and Y? Okay, so we are going to actually ester, right? Remember ester, we are going to hydrolyze it. What happens when we hydrolyze this reaction? We're going to form an acid and an alcohol. Remember that. Okay, and there is ester is always a CO group. So if there is a radical here, right? We always have to, and then our radical here, we have to drop it. We have to always break the bond from here and add an H and an OH over here. So then we can form acid and alcohol. Okay, so here we can break it one and we can break one here. We can break another one, another one here, right? Because it's COO, CO, we can break it here. We can add an acid here, acid here, right? The so CH3 acid, these two are the same basically. This one and this one are the same, okay? And there's gonna be a CO here, okay? But if you break this, right, if you break this, you won't be getting the same alcohol here. This will be CH3, CH2. You won't be getting the same alcohol here. So the thing is not to break here, but actually to look this whole thing as a, this whole thing as an alcohol compound. Um, you know, alcohol compound. So we are actually adding, we are adding H here to form acid, right? This is going to be CH3. C O O H, and then we have to add an O H here, and and because we are adding H here, we also add an O H at the other end. Okay, so this going to be this, this structure is going to be this one. So if we write that down again, it's going to be something. <coughs> it's going to be something like C H three C H two. Let me let me remove this one first. They're going to be C H three. CH2, COO, CH2, CH, and then there are going to be OH and OH over here, right? So X is going to be CH3, COOH, CH3, COOH, this is this one, and it's going to be CH3, CH2, CO, CH, CH2, right? CH2, CH3, CH2, COO, CH2, CH, OH, CH2 and then OH. So C is actually the correct answer. Now this actually tests your skills as an organic chemist. Right? So you actually have to know where to break the bonds and stuff. Okay, 39. The diagram shows a polymer molecule which monomer will produce monomer. So a monomer additus and addition polymer, right? Addition polymer. So we the monomer is going to be Monomer is going to be an alkene, right? It's going to have double bonds over here. But there's already double bonds here, as you see in the question. There are double bonds here already. And you can see these bonds are open. When these bonds are open, this means that originally these bonds were closed, right? Originally these bonds were closed. So let me draw this structure for you. C1, CH2, this Right, so these bonds were open. These bonds are open. This is the, the polymer. I'm sorry. So the, if this is a polymer, right? If this is a polymer, we have to close the double bond. We have to close the double bond. We because we want to go. This is like a reverse step, right? This is the polymer. From the polymer, you want to go back to the monomer. So we actually have to close these bonds, right? If we close these bonds. We have to form a double bond over here, right? We have to also form double bond over here. Okay. So which monomer can it could it be A? It could not be A, it could not be B, it could not be C, but it could be D. Let's check out why D is the correct answer. So it's going to form 
is CH2 CH CH upon CH H you see there are monomers the polymer already has double bond before so this means the monomer also has must have these things before right and then this is the monomer right if this is the monomer this is the monomer and this monomer we are going to turn it into we're going to open this double bond right we're going to open these double bonds up so we're going to open c h h we're going to open this double bond c h c h c h2 and c h now because we open the double bond a new double bond is going to form new double bond is going to form between these two central atoms. between this one this one because we open this one here and here these double bonds are going to go here so actually a new double bond right a double bond is going to form a bond is formed when joined up when it forms up it's a very interesting question right a bond is formed when they are joined up in the polymer and look you can see that this one is the same as this one the polymer right the polymer is going to be the same as this one right It'll be the same as this one so there are two monomers that make up this one so D is actually the correct answer Okay, I hope you get it. Now the important part here is that a bond will be formed, right, when it is joined together. The double bond will break, sure, but it will form a bond over here. That's a, um, a little bit out of the syllabus, but yeah. Question 40. There are two naturally occurring isotopes of bromine. Okay, two naturally occurring. One isotope has 44 neutrons, the other has 46 neutrons. Now we don't even need this information because you are supposed to know that bromine has two isotopes. 35 br 35 br 79 and br 81 okay we are supposed to know that bromine has two isotopes bromine 79 and bromine 81 so this has 44 neutrons this is 46 neutrons if you calculate it if you do the mathematics okay ignoring the fragments how many peaks are there in the mass spectrum of tribromo methane okay Tribromomethane. Okay, so we can draw the structure. CH. Okay, we can draw the structure here. Sorry. Okay. C. Now I'm just going to see 12. H. B. R. 3. Okay. H. B. R. 3. So there are three bromine atoms. So there can be several different combinations, right? Firstly, we can have all the bromine, could be 79, right? So this will give us an mass of 250 79 plus 79 79 250 secondly we can get all the bromine can be 80 81 sorry 81 81 81 this will give us 252 thirdly we can have one of the bromine to be 81 and two of them one to be 79 this will give us an answer of 254 okay and we can have one of the bromine to be 79 and the other two to be 81 so this will give us a total answer of 256 so there are actually how many are there one two three four four peaks because they will be different right ignoring the fragments so this is going to be a molecular ion ignoring the fragment we are going to get this okay there are three there are four different Possible combinations, therefore, we see some answer. Okay, I've come to, we have come reached the conclusion. This is the end of the paper. There's a periodic table at the back provided to you with the molar constant and stuff. Anyways, I hope you understand every single question I try to explain. If you do have any questions, please leave them in the, co in the comments down below. Anyways, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.